Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. We're excited today to be joined by Professor Kenneth J. Friedman. Just to give you a little bit of background about our speaker today, he had previously served as an Associate Professor of Pharmaco Pharmacology and Physiology at the New Jersey School of Medicine in Newark. And he got involved in MECFS after his daughter became ill with the disease alongside co-occurring fibromyalgia in the 1990s. He has served on the board of IACFS ME and is a trustee of the New Jersey ME CFS Association. Professor Friedman is no stranger to elevating ME CFS in the literature. In 2014, he organized an international group to author and publish a primer on pediatric and adolescent ME CFS that was ultimately published in Frontiers in Pediatrics in 2017. Relevant to today's webinar topic, Professor Friedman is the guest editor of the MECFS themed journal issue for Frontiers In, entitled Advances in MECFS Research and Clinical Care, that was published over 2018 and 2019. So before I hand things off to Ken, we wanted to get started with a quick poll to see who has joined us today. Uh, you'll see we've launched a poll on the screen, hopefully. Here it is. Um, we'll give you a few minutes to answer the question. Let us know if you're a person with ME-CFS, a caregiver, family member, friend, healthcare provider, researcher, or others. So we're just waiting for people to go ahead and submit their responses. We'll just give people a few more seconds. The percent voted is ticking up, so everyone get your votes in. Uh, we'd love to know your relationship to ME-CFS, what brought you in today. And looks like a lot of folks have had a chance to submit their response. So we'll just close the poll in just a couple seconds. There you go. And the results should be popping up. It looks like we had 83% um, of people respond that they're a person with uh, MECFS. 9% are a family member or a friend of a person with the disease. We have 2% that identified as caregivers, which we know would overlap with someone who's a family member. Um, and then 2% medical care providers and 5% researchers. So. Great, thank you everybody for filling in that information. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Professor Ken Frieden, Friedman and I will connect with you all again uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the work that is in this special themed issue. I want to thank the MECFS initiative for this opportunity and I also want to thank Castleton University and its Calvin Coolidge Library for providing me with the conference room and local area network access uh, to conduct this webinar. So the goals of this webinar are that I would like to present the background story of this particular themed issue, how this journal issue came into being and why it is in both Frontiers in Pediatrics and Frontiers in Neurology. I would like to summarize the contents of the issue, in other words, what types of articles are present in this issue, hopefully to whet your appetites and to get you to read some of the articles that are in the issue. I'd like to indicate the importance of this issue, at least in my opinion, what do the contents of this issue mean for all members of the MECFS community, namely researchers, clinicians, and patients, and to discuss what is next, how can this journal issue affect the future of research, clinical practice, and patient care? And finally, in the last portion of this webinar, I would appreciate receiving your questions and also um, obtain feedback of what you would like to see done in future or what should be the priorities in terms of my goals and furthering the community efforts towards solving ME-CFS. So if we could have the next slide, we'll go on to the backstory of ME-CFS, of this ME-CFS theme journal issue. So I'm going to 
institute the starting point around 2012 and 2014 when we began working on the adult primer. Um, the adult primer was asked for by the membership of the IACF SME, and I agreed that I would spearhead the effort to do it, uh, partly because the consensus manual that we had written for New Jersey was published in 2001, and we were having difficulty getting an update of that journal. And so finally, when the membership asked that we come out with an IACFS ME primer, um, we, I decided that the best thing to do would be to just forget about updating the consensus manual and start afresh. So after two years of work in 2012, we came out with a version of the adult primer. There was some language in there that patients did not like. And we had a meeting at the 2012 meeting of the IACFSME with patients to get their input. And then in 2014, we came out with a revised version. Unfortunately, subsequent to the release of the 2014 version, it seemed that we were getting no recognition from the federal government. They wouldn't cite it, uh, they wouldn't refer to it, they wouldn't acknowledge it. And when I inquired, what I was told was that because that monograph had not been through peer review, that they would not recognize it. And so when I was asked sometime in 2011, to create a pediatric primer, what I decided to do was that when we finished the work, we would at least make the effort to publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. And fortunately, Frontiers in Pediatrics agreed to publish the pediatric primer as a review article and therefore did subject it through their process of peer review. And so it appeared as hopefully some of you know, as a review article in Frontiers in Pediatrics. And the original intent was for that to be a monograph. And so therefore, after it has been published in Frontiers in Pediatrics, it now is a monograph. And for those who are interested in obtaining the monograph, it is available on thebookpatch.com and we set the price very reasonably at ten dollars with a few dollars with a few cents going back to SNCI um, as as the profit. No authors of that monograph are making any profit from um, having contributed to uh, that work. So what happened was the federal government decided that at that point they would recognize the pediatric primer and once having recognized the pediatric primer, they reversed their decision and started to recognize the adult primer. So now we are at the state where the federal government recognizes both adult and pediatric primer. The pediatric primer in the review article format in Frontiers in Pediatrics is uh, rather popular. It was the sixth or seventh most accessed journal article in Frontiers in Pediatrics for the year in which it was published. And therefore, I was given the opportunity to create a invited theme journal issue on pediatric MECFS research. Um, I wrote back and said that that is not possible because there isn't enough pediatric research being done. And I said, how about an article or a themed issue on advances in MECFS research and clinical care, both in adult populations and pediatric populations? They agreed to that, which left us with the problem that it was going to be published by PD Frontiers in Pediatrics. And so I asked that an adult journal be brought in. And so that's why it is co-listed in Frontiers in Pediatrics and Frontiers in Neurology. Next slide. So I'd like to go on to the uh, content of the issue. We start out with an editorial um, 
to introduce people to the issue. Uh, for the editorial in the first article, you don't need any technical background. It is intended to introduce lay people to the issue and some of the articles um, that are in it. So the editorial indicates that this is the first peer-reviewed indexed medical journal issue devoted to ME-CFS. And that I think is an accomplishment of its own. The only drawback that I see to this particular invited themed issue is that it does not include the severely affected. And that's because there was a lack of literature and this issue is based mostly upon the literature. And so therefore advances in MECFS research and clinical care is not complete because that population of MECFS patients is not represented and that I hope we can rectify uh, shortly in, in the coming year or two. Uh, it is then followed by an introductory article which provides a historical perspective of ME-CFS research and clinical care and also patient advocacy, which I think a lot of patients who are new to ME-CFS would probably benefit from reading. And in that introductory article, I raise the comparison of ME-CFS to HIV AIDS. Right now, ME-CFS is considered to be more severe and less treated than HIV AIDS. And uh, therefore, since it has been accepted in a peer-reviewed article, um, it is accepted by the medical community, and I hope that we can use that as an arguing point to increase the amount of funding, not only for ME-CFS research, but for ME-CFS clinical care. Next slide. So going into the more technical articles that are there, I try to categorize them and, and group them. We have a group of articles looking at the causes and triggers of ME-CFS. We have an article dealing with the patterns of ME-CFS and correlating that with the course of the disease. We have an article about the genetic predisposition for ME-CFS as genetic, genetics being triggers for ME-CFS. And finally, a third article on Epstein-Barr virus being um, a, a gene upregulator in ME-CFS patients namely that the disease is not only caused by Epstein-Barr virus itself, but that Epstein-Barr virus can influence the products that genes produce that contribute toward the disease. Next slide. We have two articles dealing with the characterization of the disease, um, and characterization of the disease is very important in terms of describing uh, the case definition. So the better you can describe the disease, the better the case definition, the better the ability to diagnose ME-CFS. We have one article that deals with the, a discussion of the complexities involved in creating a case definition, and a second article that deals with how important it is to have an accurate diagnosis of ME-CFS. We have three articles that deal with the ME-CFS diagnosis and how to validate it. There's an interesting article proposing that we could possibly use hand grip strength as a clinical biomarker for ME-CFS. If that were to occur, it would be a tool that clinicians could use to diagnose ME-CFS in their office. We have an article use or discussing two-day cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which has been used and is accepted by the federal government as a diagnostic for ME-CFS. The problem there is that two-day cardiopulmonary exercise testing has the ability or the potential to 
cause relapses in patients who undergo the procedure. And finally, some physicians have been using tilt table testing in their offices as a diagnostic for ME-CFS. And there is a, an abbreviated tilt table test, but that abbreviated test is not as sensitive to diagnosing ME-CFS as the full-blown tilt table test. And so this article deals with that issue. Next slide. We have one very interesting paper on the epidemiology of ME-CFS. And if I'm allowed to express my personal favorite, this is my personal favorite in, in the whole issue. The epidemiology of ME-CFS has been done previously essentially by random sampling techniques. Here is a new sampling technique for ME-CFS. And what it does is it samples or queries a health insurance database using machine learning to learn the epidemiology of ME-CFS. And using this technique, there are significant differences in the findings in terms of epidemiology querying a health insurance database versus using random sampling techniques. At this point, we don't know which of them is correct. I suspect that we need to have more trials of using this new sampling technique, but eventually we will arrive at a true epidemiology of ME-CFS. We have three papers relevant to laboratory research. We have a paper on gastrointestinal microbiome effects on metabolism, immunity, and gene expression. We have a second paper on dealing, summarizing the evidence of neuroinflammation and cytokine involvement in ME-CFS. And I'd like to say at this point that these two papers are the cutting edge of biomedical research in many diseases and to demonstrate that this is occurring in ME-CFS research signifies that there is not a paucity of interest in ME-CFS. There is not a lack of researchers or ability to do research as some in the federal government have claimed is the reason why we have a lack of research funding in the area so that the presence of these articles in a journal devoted to ME-CFS counters that argument and can be used in future to argue for greater research funding for ME-CFS. And finally, the third paper in this group are the opportunities for further research through the United Kingdom's Biobank. Next slide, please. We have a few papers that deal with clinical research. Namely, we have a description of the cardiovascular symptoms of ME-CFS. And then we have an interesting paper that came out of the CDC on comorbidities and their influences on ME-CFS. Namely, that the symptoms that one sees in a patient may not only be the symptoms of ME-CFS, but it's the influence of other illnesses that may be present. And this goes to the more current thought about how ME-CFS is treated. And what we're saying now in terms of treatment for ME-CFS patients is that the comorbidities need to be found and they needed to be treated. And then what would be left would be the symptoms of ME-CFS. But certainly, the healthcare provider should be looking for these comorbidities, and once they are found, they need to be treated. We have three papers on healthcare provision. We have a paper from Chuck Lapp, who has been in the, the business probably since the very beginning. He has recently retired, and he has contributed a paper in an effort to guide the primary care physician and the family practitioner in diagnosing and managing the symptoms of ME-CFS. 
so that if anyone is interested in getting a, an experienced practitioner's view about how to manage a patient with ME-CFS, that paper is there. We have a second paper documenting the lack of appropriate healthcare for ME-CFS patients. Um, that has been discussed before and it is reiterated in this themed issue. And finally, we have a unique paper in this issue on guiding the patient and his or her physician in obtaining healthcare benefits. That paper was written by an attorney who specializes in obtaining healthcare benefits for patients and also by an experienced clinician who works with that attorney in getting patients healthcare benefits. Next slide. We have a group of papers, three papers, on the needs of the pediatric and adolescent patient. Uh, this issue is covered in the pediatric primer, but here we've had an opportunity to expand out on some of the concepts um, that were presented in the pediatric primer. We have a paper that deals with the impact of the core symptoms of ME-CFS on the quality of life of young children, school-aged children. We have a second paper that focuses on the diminishment of the ability of these children and adolescents to function in the school environment. We have a paper which I think is unique to this journal issue, namely the role of the treating physician in overcoming educational challenge, challenges for the elementary student uh, through uh, the high school age student. Not only is it a role of the physician, it's incumbent upon the physician to assist. It's part of his responsibilities so that any physician who takes on the responsibility of providing care for a pediatric or adolescent patient should be aware of it. And if the physician is not aware of it, that article should be suggested to that physician that he or she read it. And finally, we have another paper that is unique to this journal, and that is a retrospective view of what adult patients who have had ME-CFS since childhood feel was the most beneficial to their treatment as an adolescent with ME-CFS. That comes out of Australia. It is a practice that has been dealing with ME-CFS for more than 25 years. And this is a gleaning of the data over those 25 years and a retrospective view from those patients. And it's highly informative. Next slide. So in terms of importance of this issue, I would say that it is the first peer-reviewed, medically indexed journal issue dedicated to ME-CFS to appear in the medical literature. It documents the biological basis, basis the patient experience of ME-CFS. It also provides tools for clinical care it provides tools for management of patient symptoms, and it discusses the special needs of children with ME-CFS as it has never been done before. It also demonstrates the robustness of ME-CFS research in all these areas, despite the paucity of funding, and think how much more we would be able to do if we were to have more funding. And finally, it provides an opportunity to create a second themed issue for frontiers in medicine that deal with the severely affected. And I am hopeful that we will get final approval from frontiers in medicine to uh, go ahead and proceed 
with that issue. Next slide. For those of you who would like to have a copy of advances in ME-CFS research and clinical care, uh, it was only just yesterday that I got the paperwork to put the order of papers for the issue into um, the system for uh, advances in ME-CFS research and clinical care. We had a piece of artwork donated for the cover of the issue, um, and it will be available as a electronic book from Frontiers. I'm going to say probably within one month's time. And this is what the cover of that book is going to look like. This is a proposed cover based upon the artwork that we submitted. Um, and so we're hopeful that this will be available in about a month's time. Um, as I stated, the interest in this journal issue, Advances in ME-CFS Research and Clinical Care, has given rise to a invitation to create a second issue. The second issue hopefully will be ME-CFS, the severely affected. It is more of a challenge than the first issue because since there is no literature, I am asking people to write for this issue. And I believe that enough people will write that it will be successful and it too will be spun off as an electronic book that people will be able to purchase if they so desire. So when the second uh, MECFS, severe, the severely affected issue is completed, we will have a complete description of MECFS throughout the range of its severity. And it will finally be in the medical literature and there will be a complete picture in the medical literature. I have to say that to my knowledge, I am not aware of any other disease where there has been a deliberate attempt to exclude part of the patient population from the study population. And if you think about it, it's to me, and I'll use a strong word, I'll say it seems absurd to exclude part of the patient population when you're trying to study a disease because then you really do not have a complete picture of the disease and nor do your tentative solutions or treatment of the disease really treat the disease in its entirety. So at this point, I am hopeful that we will be able to proceed with this issue and that finally we will have a complete picture of MECFS in the literature which we can then use as an arguing point for further funding and clinical care for all ME-CFS patients. Next slide. So the compelling arguments for increased research in patient care are the number of ME-CFS patients that exist and the severity of the disease. I think that the one paper in here that deals with epidemiology is going to be helpful in getting a more accurate number of the number of ME-CFS patients that exist in the world. And the proposed new um, second invited issue will change the minds of many clinicians, researchers, and hopefully healthcare administrators concerning the severity of ME-CFS. We should not permit ME-CFS to be characterized by the exclusive study of the ambulatory patient population. I think that is unacceptable. And so my motto, my mantra, if you will, is that we should leave no patient behind. Next slide. I thank you um, for 
the opportunity uh, to speak with you. I would like to mention that advances in any CFS research and clinical care is up for or is being considered for a Spotlight Award. The Spotlight Award is being offered by the publisher Frontiers Inn. It is given to a journal issue that has made, in their opinion, the most significant impact in medicine. If we can demonstrate that our themed issue has had a significant impact, perhaps the most significant impact in medicine for this year, we would get a Spotlight Award. The award would be $100,000. And what I have proposed is that were we to win, we would give it to the IACFS ME to hold an upcoming international meeting on MECFS. So I would ask you to support the current issue, MECFS Research and Clinical Care. Um, it is monitored by um, the number of accessions and downloads. Uh, certainly, if you were to speak it up among your friends and peers and generate interest in it, and were they to start looking at it, it would be helpful. And with that, I will be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ken. That was great. Um, and I have a clarifying question, actually. So what, other than um, downloading the issue, what can our listeners do to help support us get into that Spotlight Award place? Uh, I'm not sure as to what other parameters there, there are. Um, I'm thinking that if we could have a sense of who the people are, where they are located, that might also help. Um, the larger the geographic distribution, the better um, to demonstrate that we have either participation throughout the United States or possibly throughout the world. I think that would be helpful. I don't know if we can arrange that somehow, but I think that would be useful. Yeah, perhaps we could perhaps we could initiate a letter of support for it being get into a spotlight status and send it out, get people to sign on. So let's talk about that um, after this webinar. But we'd okay. certainly like to we'd certainly like to help. Um, in terms of questions from our listeners, um, were there any themes in the journal articles, for example, machine learning approaches that you're particularly excited about? I'm sorry, what what repeat the question? Yeah, were there any themes in the journal articles that you are particularly excited about? Um, I'm excited at, at, about the fact that the cutting edge tools are being used to explore MECFS on, on the research end of it. Um, I think that a great deal of thought has gone into revising clinical procedures and in trying to simplify the diagnostic procedures. I think that there is a movement toward an encouragement in the journal towards simplifying diagnosis and treating the symptoms of MECFS rather than worrying about the underlying causes um, in the clinical setting. Okay, great. And someone on the line who is severely ill has asked, um, how could they help with the severe MECFS issue? Uh, I, I think that uh, people who are severely ill and want to help, some of the issues are, what do they need? One of the articles that I intend to have written is, what are the needs of these patients? 
um, so that descriptions of what uh, what they need, how they feel that the community, the medical community, and the social services community can contribute to their betterment. These are the questions that I think need to be addressed. And very interestingly, the Institute of Medicine, whoops, the National Academy of Medicine, it used to be the Institute of Medicine. The National Academy of Medicine has just come out with an issue that deals with the needs of severely ill patients, but their goals are so broadly defined that um, it really doesn't deal with the severely bedbound patient. And I would like to focus in on that to describe what the needs are and then perhaps have healthcare professionals on the other side respond to it in proposing ways that within the existing structure or perhaps with modifications of the existing structures that exist today, that those services can be provided. Awesome, thank you. We've had um, a number of questions for, for wanting to share the references for all the articles. And so we'll follow up with an email to all these attendees with a link to the issue, as well as the references so people can access them after this webinar. Excellent. Um, we have another question. So what was the response like from researchers when you invited them to take part in this special issue? Uh, researchers are generally happy to have a venue in which to publish their research. I will say that there were a few who were reluctant and the reluctant, the reluctance was that because this is a peer reviewed journal, <clears throat> excuse me, they were reluctant to have their work exposed to peer review because they were afraid it would be rejected. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we had very few papers rejected out of hand. Um, I would say uh, there are 24 papers re there are 24 papers in the issue, and uh, there were only two additional papers that were rejected out of hand. That's great. Okay, and then um, on the flip side of that, how, ha how has the issue been received? Have you had any feedback from people about um, you know, how great it is that we have this whole issue dedicated to MECFS? Just wondered if you'd had any feedback. Uh, for my colleagues, um, they are very excited. They are more excited that they are getting feedback. I am getting feedback from the publisher. Um, the feedback that we get are the number of accessions that an article receives. And so there are a number of articles that have received over 10,000 accessions. And that is the highest benchmark that Frontiers um, gives uh, to, in, in terms of feedback to, to the authors. Uh, I get updates. You know, I get an update when an article reaches 1,000, 5,000, and then 10,000. So we have had multiple articles that have reached 10,000, um, which I believe is why I was offered the opportunity to create a second themed issue for them. Awesome, thank you. So I think that that's all the questions we've had come through. Um, so we could probably move on to talk about the upcoming three webinars that we're gonna do that are all part of this same theme. Um, we will, um, in October, be able to focus on the genetic predisposition for the immune system, hormone and metabolic dysfunction in this disease. And that is going to be from one of the uh, authors of that paper in this same journal. In November, we're going to talk about the microbiome. Again, um, that will be discussed by one of the authors of the article. 
And then in December, we're looking at prevalence, demographics and costs using medical claims and machine learning um, from one of the authors of that article. So hopefully you've enjoyed uh, today's introduction and we look forward to having you join us for a more deep dive in the coming three months. Uh, last, I wanted to show how you could connect with us if you haven't already. So you can register for future webinars at that first link. If you click on the second link, uh, you can sign up to be part of our email and newsletter communications. And then obviously, if you are interested in funding our organization, um, you can click on the bottom link to donate to our organization. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank Ken again for um, a really interesting webinar today, but also for championing, championing this issue. Um, we will do everything we can to get you to that spotlight award status. Um, but thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts and, and how you got to this issue with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody.